Hey, how's it going everyone? Just want to do a video. Um, I'm going to play one in the background. I'll put the link to it below. It's um, from Ravi Zacharias International Ministry. I just came across this randomly. Um, so Ravi Zacharias is an apologist and he, which is a term used to like defend uh, the Christian faith as he understands it. And so some of us would be like flat earth apologists and that kind of thing. And so um, he's pretty well known and he's um, with a guy named Vince Vital. And um, the title is, if God is just, then why give eternal punishment for temporal sin? Brilliant question, great question. And uh, I'm just gonna narrate it and then um, uh, give commentary on the response by this guy, Vince. If God is just, then why give the eternal punishment of hell for temporal sin? First off, just it's a good question, you know, and it's it's not true that that is the case. There is no way anybody <clears throat> would um, give. Um, God would not be inclined to exaggerate. He would be inclined to mercy. This system that we live in right now would not even do this. And this system is, like I've said many, many times, is completely demonic, like utterly demonic and stupid. I don't even know what term is better to be used. It's just moronic. So <clears throat> no one shoplifts and then gets the death penalty you know that doesn't make sense and so um, no one lies and then dies you know there are certain sins in the bible though that if you do do them you're just done you know and then you go to god and get a judgment and then in my opinion you're reinfused back at some point if god wants but <clears throat> um it's uh it's proportional you know to like what happens uh to what a person did and so Certain like sexual sins, for example, are just death because they're just abominations to God. God's like the person's useless. They're disgusting. You know, just get rid of them. And so that's that's his decision. But um, it doesn't say that um, one committing one of those sins means that you'll get like eternal punishment or anything like that. There's no notion of that. <clears throat> but uh, so this is a very, very good question because it goes against our understanding, our common sense. And so we have to believe that what God is doing amongst us uh, in our human interaction reflects him in some way. Either it's a complete opposite or it's just um, some sort of lower dimensional representation of the way God exercises judgment. <clears throat> and so we know through common sense, this is why this question is being asked, is that, you know, a person does something, they'll get a proportional, you know, punishment. And then for people who've read the Bible, know that God is actually inclined more to forgive, like mercy triumphs over judgment. That's written in the book of James. And so um, that's the God of the Bible will be more inclined to forgive, you know, and give a quote unquote lighter sentence. <clears throat> so right off the bat, um, the question is very, very good. And then we're going to see that the way is answered is completely evil. <laughs> Glad we could do your question. <laughs> Uh, it's a really, really good one, and uh, and not just the question about hell, but that idea of eternal punishment for temporal sin. I see that distinction in your question, and it makes it a harder question, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, let me start off, if it's, if it's all right, because I can, I can continue on from what I was saying. I think sometimes we vastly underestimate our sin and its consequences in this life. You know, sometimes when I try to explain the idea of sin to people, they want to say to me, well, really, you're exaggerating. You're not too bad. It's not like you've killed anyone. Well, I just told you that story of the guy from my childhood who went on to commit suicide. So if you ask me that. So right off the bat, his job is to um, make this temporal sin bigger. You know, he's trying to like, he's not going to soften the eternal punishment. They're, they're These Christians, these morons are sticking with that. You know, they're sticking to their guns. That's their only product to sell people is like, quote unquote, spiritual insurance, which is preventing people away from this eternal punishment. That's their only product. So they got to, they, they're not leaving that. <clears throat> so all they can now work with is temporal sin. And this Vince Vitale guy is going to elevate that and be like, hey, there's a society culture out there that like, you know, dilute your sin, not a big deal. You didn't kill anybody, all that kind of stuff. So he's going to try and pump that up question have i killed anyone that's actually a much more difficult question for me to answer 
than you might think it is. And then what are the consequences of the way I use my free will in his life, him taking his life? What did that do in the context of his family? What will that do in the context of the future generations to come? It's sobering to think about that. You know, sometimes I can look back on my life as a teenager right now and say, man, I thought at the time that was no big deal, but the reality was that was truly terrible. Well, any progress I have made in life, it's about that much. Imagine how far along this path God would be. Imagine if the standard is not someone you see on the 6 o'clock news who has done something worse than you so you can feel better about yourself. What if the standard is a perfectly holy God? A perfectly holy God. So now the problem is, <clears throat> which is what the issue a lot of people have uh, with this notion of hell being someplace, you know, in another dimension where people burn. The way he's describing it, he's creating a place for all of us. This is how arrogant Christianity is, is that he is now boosting up all of sin. Fair enough. Good. We do live in a society that waters everything down. Um, there are even righteous people in the Bible, though, who have killed people. Um, so there's, you know, even potentially even worse sins than that, that God would have to uh, forgive. But um, <clears throat> there are uh, there is a notion of diluting really everything. It's not even like to define it, much less, you know, dilute sin. And I'm talking even people uh, who claim to be like Israelites. You know, they're like, whatever, one sin equals all sin, not really a big deal, yada, yada, yada. So <clears throat> there's, a, there's a vibe in religious communities and non to, um, you know, soften, you know, sin and, and really to not even want to talk about it. <clears throat> so I'll give them that. That's definitely true. But the problem is, is that, now the door is open for all of us to go to this eternal punishment. So let's hear his reasoning, um, how that will not be the case. <clears throat> Who loves each one of us? What would our sin look like from his perspective and the multiplying and the exponential effects of that sin? Maybe Jesus gives us an idea in some of his statements that lust would look like adultery, that unjust anger would look like murder. So temporal sin, eternal punishment, when I think about the reality of my sin, I don't see the gap the way you might initially presume that it is there. But now let's talk just briefly about this idea of hell itself. How do how we don't understand this idea? So he's now put us all in the same place, which is good and true. Um, that it's everybody is now this far, far distance from God's righteousness, which is obvious. You don't even need the Bible to teach us that. And so just so we all are on the same page, we're all in the same group now. You know, we're all away from God. So now let's see who gets exempt from this idea. I think one of the best ways to understand it is in a relational framework. Jesus invites us into relationship with himself. A relationship can only be entered into if both people say yes to that relationship. If we are not willing to say yes to that relationship, then there's nothing that Jesus can do on his side. That's a, that's just a blasphemous statement. <clears throat> you know, it doesn't make any sense to say that he can't do this on his side. That doesn't make any sense. The Bible says that God can turn stones into people and make them worship God. <clears throat> so it's sad that we have to learn the Bible from people who are stupid. And this is just the problem as well in really the flat earth ball earth debate is that like we're just sitting talking in circles. It's just nonsense. We're just learning from stupid people. And um, yeah, I'm comforted just by the fact that thankfully it's everywhere you know it's not just in technical you know science that we've been our brain has been fondled um it's happening here as well because this stuff is just very very basic few scriptures would debunk this ent entire response um it's not relational um and god is not limited and uh god does not give us any choice you know like it's not like he's like putting out his hand you know like wait waiting you know for us to like Put our hand back or anything like that that's crazy <clears throat> that goes against causality you know first and foremost like god is the architect of everything and so how could he be limited by anything so that is insane for somebody to say that and then um it's not relational jesus says in in many places and you just again by common sense god is chosen you know it's this energy inside of us which again no one understands let's say that that leaves our body and um some are you know 
spirits, you know, that were in bodies that did things that please God and some weren't, and then some in between, God decided all these things. And so like, we had no choice in the matter at all. <clears throat> you know, I would say the choice that we do have is the, is the fervor, you know, that we can pursue God on the day to day. We have options to do other things and all that kind of stuff. But those people that are being drawn back to God, they don't know why, you know, it's just God is doing it. Uh, we did not create, you know, this whole narrative. And so it is not a two-handed sort of handshake. It's one-sided. And um, Jesus says this, that that those people that ultimately are on his right-hand side, he chose those people to do the things that he describes for people to do on the right-hand side, you know, works of charity um, and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so it is not this two-sided relationship nonsense that um, this guy is pushing, you know, which again is needed because then he's gonna sell, you know, his product of spiritual life insurance to prevent this eternal punishment from happening. And so really all this does is it allows them <clears throat> a real reason that this understanding um, that I teach that hell is here, you know, that we're living in because we have to learn from these morons. Uh, that's one of the many examples. And then Puri was crucified here, you know, on earth. And um, this has to be hell. And so he's going to prove that in, in a future statement. But um, it prevents them from talking about the things that are going on on earth right now. You will never hear a video of Vince Vitale or Ravi Zacharias or any of these mainstream people about the evils going on in the world um, at all. They're just completely silent. These are the most sick people on the face of the earth because they are the most religious and making a vocation, a business out of it but they will not talk about any of the evil going on. So they claim to be quote unquote closest to God, you know, um, dispensing truth, you know, about heavy topics like hell, <clears throat> sin and all that kind of stuff, God's mind, the way that he operates, but they will not make a single comment about the things that are going on, you know, on the world, which is just like wars left and right, people being enslaved, homosexuality everywhere, evil everywhere, people fighting, you know, everybody taking advantage of everybody, lies everywhere, fake news, this and that. And so Jesus like says, like, if you can't understand like the things going on on earth, how is, how is anybody supposed to make any commentary about the things going on in the spirit world? And so, um, that's these people. These are the most, I want people to be very clear about this. These people are the most evil people on earth. Anybody who claims to be very, very close to God and is not, you know, um, doing the things that are required of the basic, the basic things of like understanding the things that are going on in the world and how evil it is now and really has been throughout human history, <clears throat> they're the, these are the biggest Satanists, you know, and I'm talking about all the people like Ken Hovind and all these people, they are the most demonic, uh, mentally disturbed people on earth because they're reading the Bible regularly, but not literally looking outside their window and seeing the very, very obvious amount of evil that's out there just to preserve their business, you know? And so like the little amount of money, whatever this guy makes, 100K, 150K, um, I know a little bit about Ravi and his ministry because I met him a few times and stuff. So like they're doing pretty well, <clears throat> you know, like he lives, you know, in a nice house. His like building was like, you know, um, uh, donated to him so he doesn't pay rent, you know, for his office. I've seen his office. It's like has a bathroom inside of it. Like it's it's nice. Like he's he's living it up. So he's getting his reward right now. And so that's all he's going to get. And I would just recommend for people don't fall into this trap. Like these people are completely um, sick you know, in their mind that they would, for those little perks, you know, have a nice oak desk and like a bathroom in your office and like these little, these little conferences and all that kind of stuff. These people have completely neglected the obvious goings on of the world that are completely evil. And so Satan is giving them their reward here. And I would just say, don't um, fall into that, you know, cause it's very, very stupid. And then, so what happens when a person is not able to understand the goings on on earth, God gives them stupid theology and things that are just dumb, you know, and just blatantly wrong. And I just posted a video about the Hebrews and it's the same thing for them. Like God does not discriminate between his left and his right hand side, whoever, whatever side we fall on, he's gonna embarrass people in both both sides if they're just being stupid. And they don't want to acknowledge like, you know, the poor are increasing in number. There's, you know, leverage everywhere. There's evil everywhere, um, sin, just nonsense, you know, like just foolishness going on everywhere. Don't want to acknowledge any of that or bring awareness to that or, 
you know, stick up for people or anything like that. He's like, all right, you're, I'm going to give you the ball or then, or I'm going to give you this garbage. Sometimes people say, why is Jesus the only way to heaven? And I answer, well, because Jesus is heaven. That's what heaven is. No, that's not. No, 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 no. That's not at all what heaven, heaven is. These people, again, God has given them just um, gibberish. <clears throat> Jesus is not heaven. Heaven is a place that will be established here on earth. And, um, you know, where, where God dwells, you know, and the kingdom of heaven will be established here. And so, and Jesus will, will be the ruler, you know, he will be the leader of it. And, um, so no, he's not heaven or I don't know what this person's talking about. <laughs> like, that's insane. Why is Jesus the only way to eternal life? Well, because Jesus is eternal life. Flourishing, flourishing. Every, if there is a spirit that is in us and leaves, that thing, whatever that is, it has eternal life. It's it's God. There's some, a spirit is not like a human body. And so these people don't even know what um, eternal life is or eternal punishment is. So they don't even understand even like the very question. What does that even mean to be punished eternally? Um, that alone would need to be understood. And it can only be understood if a person understands the spirit and nobody does. So a normal person would just realize that this question is way over their head. But somebody who has read the Bible a little bit deeper, you know, and cares about the things, like I said, going on out there, God gives us a little bit more understanding. And so uh, we wouldn't fall into this trap because this person is just talking, just gibberish. <clears throat> relationship with the God who created you and desires to be in friendship and relationship with you more than anything. That That's not true. God does not want to be in relationship with a majority of people. Why would he? Um, <clears throat> I don't want to be in, a, in any kind of connection or relationship to a majority of the people. And I'm an incredibly sinful person. A majority of people, and I put myself in this, we're just disgusting. <laughs> like, we're just, think about it. We just found out that the earth was not moving recently. Like, we're just a bunch of boneheads. And like, we still can't figure this thing out. And um, we just have idiots who are trying to like sell us apps and stuff like that. Um, the world is just full of morons. So like, why would God want to be in fellowship with everybody? That's crazy uh, to think that. Thankfully, the only hope that we have is that God's humble because then he will then at least allow those people in the door because that's the only characteristic that we can align with him on. We can't be omnipotent. We can't be um, omnipresent. We can't, can't be um, omniscient and all these kind of things. Um, like God is, but we can be humble, you know, if, if God allow, if we allow God to, to perform that work in us. Um, so that's the only quote option we have. That's the only lever that we can pull, or at least God gives us the ability to think that we're pulling it when it's actually him. And so, um, who's determined all these things from the beginning? Cause again, he made everything. <clears throat> and so thankfully that that's the case. And so that's our only way out. And so, and there's not many people on earth who, who even think about one sin equals all sin. And like, I have, again, end times teachers and some of these morons, like they don't even agree that that's in the Bible or something to take seriously. So like, it's not even taught really anywhere. So the only, uh, the only way I can reconcile this mentally is that it has to be a majority of poor people that God cares about because <clears throat> they're just by their condition, they're made humble, you know, on their way there, or they've been made humble because of their current um, situation. And so that, and there's a lot of examples in the Bible where God states that, you know, his, his mind is fixated on the poor. So that's that, and I'm glad that it's consistent and it makes sense that I'm glad that I've gotten to this place mentally, that all this confusion is just to reaffirm that the obvious fact that in many places that God's heart and mind is with the poor. <clears throat> That's what eternal life is. It's not just some theme park that we get a ticket to and then we can go or decide not to go. It is the relationship itself. And that's why someone... No, it's not. Um, that's not what it is at all. Um, so this relationship stuff, whatever he's talking about, uh, is crazy. You know, like it's just um, complete madness. And um, the way, uh, I guess, that they're going to sell this quote-unquote relationship is that these morons govern how to enter into that relationship. And then that's their um, business. <clears throat> Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, which is just a corporation. Like Christopher Hitchens said, heaven would be hell for me. Why? Because he doesn't want to be with God. Because he said that explicitly at one point in his life. Uh, he probably wouldn't want to be in heaven if the people that 
claim to be going there are there, like the Ken Hovens and the Pastor Andersons. I wouldn't want to be there. If Tahar is there, all these uh, end times teachers, all these people, I'm not going there. <laughs> I'll just be like, whatever. Like, I feel out of place here. I'm going to feel out of place there. I don't want to go in either. I don't want to be around either of those groups. So that's probably a small, I'm not completely accusing Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins and all these people, but um, part of their qualm would be looking around and be like, you want me to be around these people? <laughs> like, hell no, they're morons. Again, we're, we all could make a lot of religious people or sorry, atheist religious people by having just a civil discussion on the shape of the earth and proving whatever it is. But we can't because we're just morons. And so we could actually win some of them over with real, you know, rigorous math and science and physics, but uh, we can't even get that figured out. And so they're not, I'm not excusing again, their whole sentiment that they don't want to um, be in heaven. That's obviously God programming them, letting them know that, you know, their time is up and um, their, their job is up, you know, what they needed, what they, what he needed them to do. But I'm speaking from an earthly perspective, like, it makes sense, you know, like why, why they would say something like that, because we don't want to be around these people because like these people don't even exercise common sense. You know, they don't even read the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it support any of this gibberish, this relationship nonsense and um, this notion of eternal punishment, <clears throat> the way they people describe like it. People like Friedrich Nietzsche, John Paul Sartre, Thomas Nagel, the philosopher, they say, I don't want to be with God. It would be an invasion of my privacy. It would take away my autonomy. That's not attractive to me. Okay, so P <laughs> that's funny, like, just with the world that we live in now, this system is all of those things, you know, stripping away sovereignty, autonomy, um, privacy, all that kind of stuff. So this surveillance state is the opposite of God. And um, that's what we have now. So again, these people that use that as an excuse, they'll be the last people to point out how that's going on right now. So there's a contradiction with them. Again, they're actors, but... Um, that's not a valid excuse, unless you're the first person in line pointing out the incredible amount of that that's going on here, and it's everywhere. Well, if that's not attractive to you, then God is not going to force you to be with him. And being apart from him in the context of eternity, that's what we call hell. God, you cannot be apart from God. That doesn't make sense. Um, you can't go somewhere and hide from God. God can't stuff you in a corner and be away from his presence. That, first of all, doesn't make sense. Uh, there's no place like that. Um, so that is not hell, you know? So this person just doesn't even, these are like, these are just basic like concepts um, using logic that a person should have before they even read the Bible. You know, it's not like the Bible is going to start telling us random stupid things that don't make sense to our experience here on earth. These are all, everything going on here on earth is a lower dimensional representation of what's going on in a higher dimension. And God is the infinite higher dimension. <clears throat> but there's still a logic to it. This is just a lower dimensional representation of it. So they're failing to understand that they still need to use logic, you know, to understand the Bible. It's interesting that the Bible uses a phrase when it refers to hell at times, it talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Teeth are a physical thing. No spirits have like teeth, you know, and like, no, there's no weeping in this in the spirit world and stuff like that, you know, that's not, uh, that's a physical thing, you know, that's happening. And so that weeping and gnashing of teeth, describing the lake of fire and all this punishment. And like I read in, in a, in a prior video in Ezra, like God's judgment for iniquity <clears throat> is going to happen here on earth. And so, um, and it could be all, it could be us, you know, like we don't know, like the, the amount that, um, God is going to serve up to all of us until it actually happens. And all we can do is pray for mercy and pray for mercy for others too. Uh, but weeping and gnashing of teeth, teeth, you think like spirits have teeth, like they're brushing their teeth, you know, like plaque and <laughs> like fillings and stuff like that. Oh my God. That may seem like a very hard- American Christianity, America is just completely brain dead. Like one zillion percent. Praise to you and it always did to me as well. But in my family, we've dealt with a lot of estrangement. At one time, two uncles of mine, they didn't speak for about seven years. But I have a vivid memory of the two of them being at a wedding together. They both had to be at this wedding. They had to be in each other's physical presence and yet relationally estranged. And you know what I saw on their faces? Literally weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is the natural reaction. So now he's supporting the point that 
that hell is a physical thing, you know, and that's why God uses that terminology. He didn't use it by mistake. Like, oh, whoops, like I meant to use spiritual weeping and spiritual gnashing. Like, my bad. No, God, is, like he did that on purpose. Like he's trapping these, these morons, uh, again, selling their product of spiritual insurance because that's all they have. And this quote relationship, which will, I guess, save you or something. And um, so he's doing the right thing of looking at two people who can be next to each other and, um, you know, clenching their teeth, grinding. And, you know, one one spirit could be right with God and the other won't. And then the Bible says this in many places that God is here to bring division. He's here to divide, you know, people. And um, he's doing it, you know, he's doing it based on people who are willing to worship him in spirit and in truth. And very few people are willing to do that. And so the people that are not, they're going to experience weeping and gnashing of teeth. He will destroy them, you know, and we look forward to that day, even if it's us, because like then God's judgments can be made manifest, you know, and then the kingdom of heaven can be established on earth for those who um, God has already chosen and is preparing for that place. So um, weeping and gnashing of teeth is a physical thing. He should know this because he's using an example of a human interaction involving weeping and gnashing of teeth. Also, this guy's name, Vince Vitale, VV, like Red's Redder, RR, VV. Um, these, are, again, it doesn't guarantee that he's on the left hand side, but you know, if you watch Russian Vid's channel, um, it's a way that God encodes that. Reaction to being in the presence of someone who you know full well you're supposed to be family with, the person who is supposed to love you most, the person you were intended to be in the deepest friendship with, and knowing that there's nothing other than your own stubbornness that keeps you from being together with them. That all it The Bible says God hardens people's hearts, you know, and so God does this, you know. God has given us the ability to worship him <clears throat> in spirit and in truth, and um, one of those truths, for example, is a flat stationary earth. And so there was a time where a lot of us were not able to worship God, you know, fully because we didn't have full truth um, or even really any of it. But now the floodgates looks like they're being open, you know, and we can see this nonsense easily, hopefully. And, you know, flat earth and all the other evils and all that. So receiving truth is the same as receiving lies because we just multiply them by negative one. So there's a lot of lies. There's a flood of lies, which then it allows us to take the flip side of those and understand the truth. And so, um, you know, now we're able to like worship God, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But there was a time where our hearts were hardened, you know, our minds were closed and God did it. And so um, it's not uh, us, you know, and the, the Bible says that even the wicked are estranged from the womb. So God creates um, every evil people on the left-hand side, hopefully we're not one of them, um, for his own narrative. And so God is doing all this. Would have taken on either side, just one of my uncles to say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And that relationship would have been restored. And it is the same with God. He will not force that upon us. But if we will just say, I'm sorry, there's nothing he desires more deeply than relationship with each one of us. So using an example of two people who are holding some petty, you know, some nonsense probably, and um, God's going to be like, like someone tried to corner Jesus and say, like, my brother's not splitting my inheritance, our inheritance. He's like, what does that have to do with me? <laughs> you know, that's what he's going to say to us. He's like, what are you talking about? You know, he's like, of all the things that you could have asked, that person could have asked God, um, you're talking about that, you know? And so all these like little petty squabbling things and these people, and this, especially hopefully these two people that he's describing in his family don't claim to be religious because they're just idiots um god god's not involved with that kind of stuff like those people are just actors and who cares whether they have a beef with each other or not they're just actors you know they're just morons um somebody who understands god understands first and foremost that god is sovereign and he's in charge of everything and if a person is allowed in his presence it's only by mercy and um should be incredibly incredibly inclined to forgive <clears throat> um because uh, God, God will forgive on that basis. And so that example was stupid. You know, we don't need to hear any of that. It just proves again that he's probably surrounded by people that are just like him, um, not spiritual, and um, have no idea what's going on about the God of the Bible. So let's hear what Ravi has to say. You know, 
it's fascinating uh, when we're asked questions like this, uh, we ask them of ourselves too. We often think of these questions and struggle with it. Uh, when you read this... That's the only honest thing that I've, I've heard through this. Like, you should struggle with this. Even people who have understanding that we're living in hell, it doesn't make it easy to understand, you know, because then we'd have to understand why. And even if you add reincarnation on that, which you have to, in my opinion, that still doesn't make it easier. It just leaves more and more questions. So that is the first honest thing that I've heard so far. Story of the younger son going out and squandering all the father's wealth and returning. There are always surprises in Jesus's stories. In fact, I'm Many of you may know the name of Nabil Qureshi, who passed away, my colleague. He and I were in the process of co-authoring a book. And with Nabil gone, uh, Abdul Murray has taken that role now, and he and I are writing a book on the whole life of Christ through Eastern eyes. When you listen to the stories of Jesus, there are surprises in them that are both explicit and extended you don't expect that story to end that way. The younger boy coming home, I come from the East. If I'd taken my portion of the wealth, my dad didn't have much, but if I'd taken it and gone and squandered it and then returned, I know what my dad would have done. Tell him to come right here and fall on his face and I wanna to talk to that boy. But the story surprisingly ends in two ways you don't expect. The first, is that the father gathers his robes and he runs outside to welcome the son back. That's the grace of God extended in the gospel message, which is very unique. Please hear me now. In every other worldview, salvation is earned. Your good deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds. It's earned in some ways here as well, from an earthly perspective. Um, it's not just um, a sinner's prayer, you know, or anything like that. It's way more than that. And again, just use it the time that we live in, for example, it's in the very least, this is just the foundation is like, we have to pursue truth, you know, like in, in the world, all, all things that are true. And we won't know all of it, but that's very basic. You know, we have to defend the poor, the widows and all that kind of stuff. And like, the list goes on, you know, and we have to forgive other people because the Bible says that if we don't, God won't forgive us. So there are many, many works that are required um, for God to accept us. Many, many, you know, and so um, the amount that I would say God offers um, grace, um, cushion, is the times that we don't know, <clears throat> you know, like, or... Um, we didn't have the resources, for example, to like help, you know, every poor person that, that we walk by. That is the room that God God gives us because he knows that obviously this system that he made is evil. And so he knows that we're, we can't just be like Mother Teresa and stuff like that's the cushion, you know, and like <clears throat> he'll give us time, you know, like to forgive people. It's not like you have to do it like in, a, in 30 seconds or else, you know, like a lightning bolt's going to zap us. Like he gives us time, you know, to think these things through. But you know, not infinite time, you know, we can't hold a grudge in heaven and like have people walking around starting other beefs in, in heaven. We'll just again have this again. <laughs> and so like, you don't have forever. And so um, again, these people are again, just proving that they have no idea what the Bible says, and they're just pushing their um, corporate agenda. Your righteousness has to exceed your own righteousness. Your karma has to be paid only in the gospel message is salvation a gift, the gift of grace, unmerited by you. So the father comes out. The father comes out to receive the son. That's a surprise. And the they don't even understand salvation. Salvation is actually, again, here on earth. It's not avoiding eternal punishment, which, like I mentioned before, um, is an earthly thing. You know, hell is here on earth. <clears throat> Eastern story. But there's a second surprise. There's an older brother was pretty upset. He said, what's this? I've been here all along and he's the boy who's getting the party. What, have I, what, have, what do I need to do? You see, he's the one who had never enjoyed the love of the father, even though he lived under the same roof. He never... This has nothing to do with the question being asked. <laughs> so I just want to, they don't want to address it because they don't know how to answer it. So I just want people to be aware of that. This has absolutely nothing to do with 
um, temporal sin receiving eternal punishment. God, to break free from his own selfishness, to extend joy and the love of the Father. I say to you, to somebody who doesn't want God, even heaven would be hell for that person. Goodness would be uh, uh, an angering thing to the individual. All I can tell you is this, if any man comes unto me, Jesus says, I will in no wise cast him out. You have the opportunity to come to him. If you desire not to be with him, he will second your motion. And that is a choice you make for time and eternity. There's a younger boy who repents. There's an older boy who's in the house, but never really enjoys being with the dad. You and I can fall into one of those two categories. That's a very, very uh, satanic description of that story. Um, the the son that stayed close to close to God in this in that case the the, the father, uh, they, they he loves him, you know he just he's the one that did not go go astray, and um, he's like everything I have is yours, you know, and so like it's he's not going to hell or anything. he's not in hell or anything. That is the one who who is asking a logical question. Um, if you're this happy for somebody who's gone out and spent his money on prostitutes and you know spend half of your riches how come you don't ever greet me that way every day when i didn't do those things that's a very very logical reaction and in that story he's completely butchering that person who stayed there is not in hell or hates god or not choosing god or anything like that god is fully pleased with those people you know that do that he is using this story to, as a narrative for us to understand for people who go and commit tremendous amount of sin, which we could all, we have to put ourselves in that story. Any human should read that story and always take the, the the side of the sinner, you know, and know that we have then gone into the pig pen, literally that person did and, um, or was about to and come back and receive mercy, but they didn't come back just um, meandering back. They were transformed um, with, by humility. You know, they were just like, oh my gosh, like this situation that I put myself in is just deplorable. You know, like I will come back and take the lowest position and um, just hope that he will accept me, you know? And so that is, that person came back a quote, better person. You know, they're in an ideal sense, they will not leave again. They will not even be inclined to go uh, anymore, ever into anything like that because they, they've been with the pigs, you know, they've been in the pig pen and America is that pig pen. This is, this is metaphoric, symbolic for all of us, you know, who are alive and really any time throughout human history, but definitely now we're in the pig pen. And a lot of us are doing the logical thing and saying it would be better to clean the toilets in the kingdom of heaven than to be here in Babylon amongst just morons, you know, and, and idiots and, um, who want to centralize everything, uh, including the gospel. And so that's reflective of a narrative for, for all of us, you know? Um, and then God decides, you know, it's up to him if we have been chosen that he will meet us, you know, with that robe and be, be happy, you know, when we return our spirit to him. And so, which is his. And so that's, <laughs> that's the story that is completely butchering it. He's, he's making, uh, the person, the, the son that did not stray away, he's, he's vilifying him when God is fully pleased with that son, you know? And who knows what in the spiritual context God has in reward for those who don't go astray, you know, who don't sin uh, too much and all that. God does care. There are different types of sin. And Jesus even says this, there are lesser sins and greater sins. And um, there are rewards in place for committing fewer, you know, that's just obvious. And so, um this whole lesson eight minutes and 31 seconds of just nonsense you know being spewed um, out of the mouths of people who are again claim to be closest to god i want people to be very very clear these people are satanists these are the most disgusting people to ever exist they're worse than atheists they're worse than anybody because they claim to be closest to god and um, the closer a person gets to god the more inclined they should be to be humble and then God will reveal to them things about him that are true, you know, and then where his heart and his mind is. And um, he will tell them certain things, you know, about his plan, not everything, 
but they won't make rookie mistakes like this. This is just complete um, corporate uh, Christianity um, with uh, the product of spiritual insurance um, mixed with poetry and um, irrelevant stories. Hope everyone's doing well. Bye.